Welcome to Steel Blue Roll Call, where we discuss everything related to the roll-up door industry. Today, we're focusing on navigating supply chain and manufacturing in 2023. We're pleased to introduce two guests from within Steel Blue who are experts in their field. First, we have Bray Allen, who was recently promoted to the Chief Operations Officer position. Congratulations. He's got a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. He's got a lifetime experience in the door industry, multiple patents under his belt. He has a proven track record of driving progress and innovation, quality, safety, and process improvements. And next, we have Steve Weltmer, the Chief Supply Chain Officer for Steel Blue. Welcome. Steve brings a wealth, of, he brings a wealth of experience and expertise in manufacturing, sourcing, and supply chain management. We're excited to have Bray and Steve join us today to share their insights and perspective on the current state of the industry and how Steel Blue is navigating the challenges and changes in supply chain and manufacturing. So let's get started. Supply chain for the longest time, it's not really been front of mind for a lot of people in the public. The recent pandemic was a lot of people's first introduction to how important supply chain is to everyday life. For those that are not as well versed, what really is the supply chain? And then also, why is it so vital to modern business operations? Well, that's a great question because supply chain sounds like a buzzword or catchphrase probably to many people. It's truly the backbone of industries. It's equally as important to have a great workforce and sales team. But again, without supply and supply chain, obviously in raw material, the folks in the plant don't have anything to make or produce. So again, looking at supply itself and how it equates to everyday use with the pandemic, obviously everything was turned upside down and Folks were changing pace, thinking, okay, the pandemic, everything's going to slow down completely. We quit buying supply, or not us, but many industries quit buying supply, when in turn, things tended to speed up in a lot of capacities, especially in the in the door industry and, and storage industry. How intertwined would you say supply chain and domestic manufacturing are just in general? And to what degree can one really live without the other, or can they? Domestic supply, that's a good point you brought up, especially in the roll-up door industry. A lot of players are using China-made products, which, as we heard during the pandemic, they had lockdowns, shortages, outages that really played havoc on the industry. And one thing we're trying to do at Steel Blue is we're trying to diversify our supply. We're trying to utilize more domestic That way we can control, at least within the U.S., what we can do. Obviously, it's easier to work with a domestic company because we don't have the timing that's involved. Shipping across things by domestic supply and partners were much better suited. Lead times are better. It's just really a better situation for us. And again, minimizing outages and shortages. Now that supply chain is really top of mind for now everybody, whether you're in manufacturing, construction, architecture, just across so many industries, where would you say that the supply chain issues really impacted, maybe not steel blue, but just the door industry as a whole the most? Then would you say that like steel blue, others have also had to pivot as well? And maybe how did they go about doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Again, in this industry, when a good portion of the supply has typically come from China in the past. And again, as I mentioned before, with the lockdowns, pivoting to a domestic supply for components and the the smaller type items, that's where we've really had to look closer on who's supplying us when and why. Again, coming from overseas, it's been such a difficult time to manage because obviously you have your supply set up, you've got dates you're expecting, and then a lockdown happens. So again, yeah, Steel Blue is not the only ones that have had to manage themselves properly. The paint industry, for example, raw materials for paint and even painted coil for us have had its share of issues with the the car industry with cars and batteries. They actually take a very similar or take the same resin as what our painted coil takes, which is interesting. It doesn't seem one should match up with the other one, but that has put major constraints on coil coating, folks that are putting up roofing, architectural items. So again, it's not just the storage, but it's really all industries has been affected greatly by this. Yeah, I can imagine. I know that you've been working in supply chain for a good amount of your career. And so have we always been 
mostly a global supply chain where we're getting a lot of stuff from China, getting a lot of stuff from overseas, or were we domestic at some point went global and then now we're going maybe back to domestic? I think, yeah, right now, as much as we've been utilizing, and again, not just Steel Blue, but everybody utilizing China, obviously with the current situation, not just from the pandemic, just from political aspects, everything else, we are focused on domesticating, buying from the U.S., manufacturing in the U.S. That's really what we're about. And other industries are seeing that as well, just again, because of the difficult times they're having. But that's what Steel Blue's focus is. We want to be domestically driven and support manufacturers within the U.S. That's incredible. I'm glad that Steel Blue is making that pivot for the country and also just for Steel Blue's longevity as well. Talking about that pivot that Steel Blue is making more towards a domestic supply chain, what really is available on the domestic side compared to international? What kind of parts or materials are we able to source domestically now these days? And some of what we do produce and make, they're not just a specific part. It may be an item that's built and has multiple pieces in it. But again, we've, we've utilized some very good machine shops, folks locally that can support us, that can grow with us. That's what's very important as well. We want to be partnered with people that can work with us, have the flexibility to support our customers and be prepared to pivot one way or the other. So again, having a domestic supply locally really takes us to where we need to be. And again, partnering with the right companies, it's going to make us better. I couldn't agree more with Steve. The industry, the country, even the global market as a whole has faced a, some severe constraints over the past couple of years. Steve and his team have done an impeccable job of trying to navigate through those waters. To what's the most resourceful method for getting what we need? Him alluding to bringing more things domestic, that just gives us more visibility. It gives us more control. And so we continue to strive to do that. Obviously, we're not the only ones in our economy that is recognizing that. And so it does put some constraints there. So we're continually promoting increased capacity with domestic suppliers. We're trying to do a much better job at forecasting what our needs and capabilities are and things in the coming months and coming years to enable our supply mechanism, our vendors to be more prepared for what we're doing. And, and it's really a strategic plan as to how we're going to accomplish what we're, what we've set out to do. And so it's very much integrated within each other. One one can't survive without the other. Absolutely. Going back to just talking about supply chain again, something that us, you know, regular folk, we hear a lot about is a bottleneck supply chain. And so how does a bottleneck supply chain impact the cost of a roll-up door to the consumer? Are there times when maybe the supply chain is actually working in favor of consumers in regards to the final price that they're paying for their projects as well. Maybe there's a flip side to it. With certain bottlenecks, obviously you end up limited on supply. So when that situation happens, then when things slow down, it's creating more demand and it takes us to another place where we're looking for maybe other suppliers, help from another source. And again, the laws of supply and demand typically will drive prices up. So bottlenecks for the most part aren't positive on our side of the fence. And again, we're about delivering an overall exceptional customer experience. And that's what we're about. And bottlenecks cause delays, service issues, quality issues. So yeah, bottlenecks aren't, aren't a positive thing in our industry. I guess on the flip side, so everything's running smoothly. And as it would be intended. And so I guess that would mean inversely that prices would be more favorable to consumers or to your clients because everything's coming in on time and you're not having to source stuff elsewhere. You're describing the perfect world. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and that way we have supply at the plant in the pipeline on order. That way Bray and his team can continue running. Our sales folks can continue selling more. So again, yeah, you're absolutely describing the perfect world. Thank you. We don't get to talk about that very often. Yeah, so Jared, I, I would just like to compound on that just very briefly. One of the things that we've seen in the industry as of late or more so in the past couple of years is regardless of 
the price associated, the end cost to the consumer, or be it raw material cost to us. It's really over the past couple of years, it's not been about what a person is willing to pay or what we're willing to pay for raw materials. It truly has been about availability. So we've run into situations on numerous occasions where we would be willing to pay more, but just the sheer fact that it's unavailable, you can't get what's not there, right? And so we've seen that on more occasions than we'd care to, both, again, on raw material. And if you look at our market today as a whole, both the end consumer market, even those that are willing to pay higher costs, where it still makes good business sense, still the availability is not there. And one of the old cliches of the fact that things are called supply chain in itself, it just leads you to the mindset of old cliche that a change only as strong as the weakest link. And so when there's a broken link or a missing link in that chain, it doesn't just affect the cost of the chain. The chain's rendered inoperable at that point. It does no one any good because as bad as you want it, just can't get it. We've seen that probably a lot more than what we would like to. Again, that has negatively affected the end consumer market. And that's one of the things that I appreciate about Steve and his team and in general, the team at Still Blue is we've kind of seen that and planned for that as much as possible. The biggest thing for us is just continuing to work, communicate, and drive through that and not make commitments that we can't adhere to. Being able to maintain what our customer expectation is and really truly deliver on what we commit to has probably been the best thing that Still Blue could have done. There's things that are outside of our control when it comes to supply chain and raw materials. So we've done a really good job of controlling what we can. And that's communication. That's service. That's driving and keeping our segment of the market informed as to what the horizon looks like. A statement internally that a lot of times the news that we deliver is not the best news, right? It might not be what you want to hear. But we're giving you accurate information. And as long as you have accurate information, you can plan accordingly. I think what we've dealt with in the market the past two years has been such volatile information that no one's been able to plan. And again, our team has excelled at planning based off of what the actual data was, not just optimism or wishful thinking. We've actually done strategic work and made strategic moves to ensure that we can continue to trend in the direction that we're going today. I think that's something that you know, people that work with Steel Blue really appreciate as well. I mean, talk about people that are project managers, right? And they have all these teams that they're working with that are relying on them. And right. they have these deadlines that they have to meet. And they'd rather you just give it to them straight at the end of the day so they right. can make their adjustments. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And since we have had these sort of bottlenecks in the industry or in raw materials, I guess, what's the longest bottleneck you've seen for a raw material? Like how far backed up have things actually gotten in a worst case scenario? I think from a supply chain standpoint, an example, if a company's bringing material in from China or Taiwan or whatnot, it can be 19 to 20 weeks. And again, that was at the height of shipping issues when the ports were filled up and they were having issues with dock workers. But again, switching to a domestic scenario, typically we can get material or goods within 30 days, within a week, depending on what it is. So again, going from four to six months versus two weeks, 30 days, 60 days, obviously it's easier for us to plan. And again, I can keep Bray and his team rolling as smoothly and efficiently as they always do. And again, any bottleneck is just that. It's going to hinder supply and service and ultimately quality, and you're going to have an upset customer, which that's not what we're about. We really truly want the customer to have an exceptional experience. And obviously we want them to reorder with us. So if we get it right the first time, the phone's going to ring again. And that way we keep servicing and committing. We do what we say we're going to do and follow up. And again, as Brad mentioned, communication, that's really the bottom line internally and externally. So the biggest constraint that we've seen thus far, as far as the bottleneck would be investment in equipment, right? Because a lot of the equipment that we use also consumes steel and various raw materials. So if the equipment manufacturers weren't prepared for those bottlenecks, then, you know, we've seen some equipment purchases that we've made be as far out as 18 months. And that seems very egregious, but the fact is, again, no matter how bad we want it or what we're willing to pay for it, if it's just not available, it's just not available. We saw a tremendous spike in equipment lead time from six to eight months to 18 months in the course of a few weeks, honestly, is what it seemed like. I'm sure that 
time flew there, but even now today, while equipment lead times are getting a little better, they are without question not where we need them to be in the industry. And thankfully, again, it's, we've leveraged some of our lifelong resources. Steve and I have both been in this industry a good while. And collectively, we've all leveraged some of those resources to partner up with the right people that can help us with quality equipment in the most timely manner, still at competitive pricing. But we've probably paid a little more for some things that if we had a little more patience, maybe could have gotten a better deal on it. But again, we were willing internally to take the the hit, we'll say for that, in an effort to maintain that service level that we committed to, right? And so if it cost us a little more money on the front end to purchase equipment and expedite and do whatever, we'll never sacrifice the quality of what we buy. We'll never sacrifice the integrity of who we are, uh, but at the end of the day, our goal is to maintain that level of service in the industry. If that means we've got to do things that are somewhat unconventional, when you think about a company that's trying to make a profit and we spend a little more money than what we had in the CapEx budget or something of that nature, the last couple of years, that's been part of doing business, right? And so we've done that and we continue to do that and we will continue to do that. It's all about maintaining that level of service that we've committed to. That is our number one goal. And Again, supply chain, equipment, sales, accounting, every facet of our organization has that same goal in mind. That's what we do. Yeah, I think a company that lives its mission over and over again to the point to where the consumer is well aware of it. I think you're just building that trust over time. And yeah, kudos to you and kudos to the team for really sticking to your guns on that. Thank you. Talking about other shortages as well as semiconductor chip shortages, that's been something that's been talked about quite a bit for supply chains. Is for when you talk about the semiconductors, does it affect not only the manufacturing of doors that have smart chip technology, but then also even down into the manufacturing pieces that might also incorporate that technology as well? In my professional opinion, it's more about the equipment than it is the actual product. The industry and the global markets, we've seen extended lead times as we were just talking about on the equipment. So that's been a challenge that we've just had to work through. And a lot of those semiconductor chips and things of that nature, they're all part of that, right? So the equipment that we use today is really advanced equipment. And so it's not something that I'm just going to build in my garage. It takes really unique skill set to build a lot of that. And so it pertains a lot to the equipment, more so on the manufacturing side. And then on the end consumer side, products that we go out into the market and source from latch technology to whatever, it has impacted some of that. As we start seeing things in the industry that's more cloud-based or web-based integrated technologies, it affects some of that, right? We found a what I believe is a fairly substantial segment of the market. They're not deterred if the power's out or they're not deterred if the internet's down or if a battery's dead and this or that. They still like that ability to control, so to speak, the destiny of whether or not they get into their unit. So semiconductors and things, some of that technology has affected some of that, but you still have a very robust market segment that's, for lack of a better term, that's somewhat old-fashioned that likes the ability to unlock their unit. We know of customers that have projects that are very much technology-driven and integrated, and then their ability to, they left their cell phone at home, and so they can't access their units. So whereas opposed to a hard key, that's a little different deal. And I think there's still a large segment of the market that appreciates that Simple, old fashioned, but again, the simplicity of it is you just got to stick the key in and turn it and you have access. So I would say that's both the upside and the downside to the things like semiconductors and how they affect equipment and end result product. That makes total sense. Um, For, I guess, like me at the personal level, there's not really much that I feel like somebody like myself could do (laughs) to combat the supply chain issues. What can people do to ensure that their orders are fulfilled as close to on time as possible. From a supply standpoint, and as you say, you don't feel like you personally affect the supply chain. Actually, you, customers, everybody does and can in a major way. Obviously, improvements are made every day as we're talking about technology. But at the end of the day, customers that are organized enter their orders early and accurately and give us the most time to schedule and work our process, work the inventory, schedule trucks, so on and so forth. That helps us help them. So actually just using you as an example, yeah, you can help us by being early and accurate 
obviously when things, and this is the real world, things change. Oh, I need a couple more of these. And again, that still gives us the flexibility to be proactive. But then in some cases, if something changes, we can be reactive. So again, a customer base can truly affect supply chain in a positive way. A company that's waited for the last minute, putting orders in, it makes it a little more difficult for us. Obviously, we're going to work with everybody and always do everything humanly possible to supply the order and make sure it's on time. But again, customers truly have some skin in the game as well. Bringing it back to the chip shortages, but mostly I brought that up because it's something that's also very top of mind for people like myself. And we hear it in the news all the time. What are some other factors that come into play that sort of hinder a manufacturer's ability to just get orders out on time? One of the biggest things that we see today, which is also affected just by general demand, transportation seems to be a sticking point today in a lot of cases, right? The availability to to have a load covered and get things from point A to point B, both in raw material and finished goods. I think there's a lot to be said for what's coming up in the next couple of years. You're starting to see generation that used to take pride in traveling across the country, seeing the world, driving a truck. And a lot of that generation is now going into retirement. And so when you think about things that I, on the operations side, look at and see, okay, what's the next big hurdle that we're going to face? What's things that we need to be prepared for? Again, that strategic planning, right? What's the thing that we need to be prepared for today that is going to happen in the next five, 10 years? And I feel like transportation is going to be, at some point, it's going to be a real sticking point. And again, because when's the last time you saw a young person coming out of high school or even out of college wanting to get in an 18-wheeler and drive across the country hauling material? So I just think that's somewhat of an industry that's going to see significant change over the next few years. And as you see more initiatives come on board, we don't know what the full impact is going to be to the trucking and transportation industry. Just fuel prices and things recently, there's been a lot of availability that's been that's gone away just because they couldn't sustain their business in a market like we've seen in the past two, three years. I'm still uh, intrigued and watch and monitor that closely. There's a lot of collaboration goes on in that. And so that, that's where I fall in the operation. Side. I'm sure Steve has much more to add on the other things on the supply side that can affect some of that. I agree 100% what you're saying, Barry, with the transportation, along with new regulations, government, trying to make the highway safer, obviously, and as Barry mentioned about folks retiring and most young adults coming out of high school and college aren't wanting to jump in a, an 18-wheeler. But again, with all the regulations that come along with this, and again, in order to make it safer for all of us to drive down the road, it's actually has an effect where we don't have as many drivers. And again, that, that is huge. Three to five years, how's transportation going to work? Who's going to do it? Can we look at rail a little bit closer or possibilities? Drones, yeah, maybe we can deliver some doors via drones. But again, I think that really is a good point, Bray, that trucking is kind of like the word supply chain, but it's something you don't think of. It's just automatic to customers. Okay, Steel Blue is going to make it. Okay, it's just going to magically end up on a truck and pull into our job site. But that is something we have to focus on and really consider getting to the customer and how to get to the customer in a timely manner without paying an arm and a leg. That's something that as a consumer, somebody that uses Amazon Prime, stuff gets to your door mm-hmm. real quick. And you don't even think about the back end of the truckers that have to bring stuff to all these massive warehouses. Mm-hmm. Something that I've seen, and I'm just curious of if you've seen any development on this end, which is I, I saw Tesla's working on these massive electric self-driving semis and Do you think that down the line, that's something that would be possibly viable? Just curious if you guys have seen anything in regards to that as well. I will never say that anything is impossible, right? There's been so many technologically advanced moves made over the past few years that the sky's the limit, so to speak. I think all things like that are possible, whether or not they still meet the demand and our population as a whole, both as a nation and as a global economy, it's growing exponentially, right? And it being outside, living outside of Atlanta, there's continuous road construction, right? As soon as they finish the project, it's like they tear the road up and start building on that same road again because they're just not able to keep up, right? I'm intrigued to see what happens over the next few years with how transportation in itself evolves. And who knows, that might mean we, I don't want to let all my intelligence and secrets out, but who knows, we may have much smaller locations more readily available 
across the country rather than shipping from one or two locations. Maybe we have a hub and spoke kind of distribution footprint so that bring a truckload from Northern California to Washington State might not be as big of a, as big of a deal. While we think often about supply chain and operations, supply chain, we typically look at it as inbound material, but those guys in supply chain, Steve and his team, they really affect the outbound. Their perception of how things get from point A to point B really also has a bearing on how we ship post-manufacturing to the consumer. And we've got some things in the works there. Again, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. That's incredible. Yeah, I can't let all the cats out of the bag. And so I think the, the majority of this conversation has been about, a, I guess, a lot of tough stuff that's going on in the world right now and in the industry as a whole. But you've both been in the roll up industry for quite some time throughout your careers. And I guess what about today in regards to manufacturing, supply chain, or just the industry as a whole? Would you say are, you're encouraged by the way things are moving in the right direction, say, maybe compared to 10, 20 years ago. Go ahead, Steve. I'll let you take the first crack. From that perspective, looking back 10 years ago versus now, obviously the economy is different. It's a different generation of working class. I think the younger adults have probably become smarter, playing their games, learning how to code, and so on and so forth. But I guess to me, as time goes on, it's typically a little more difficult to find employees and the right employees with the right experience. That's been difficult from 10 years ago versus today. And again, the number of people we have to have come through the door, not just in Braves world, but even looking at supply chain, who can manage a process, manage a supplier, you've got to have the right person. And that's really where I think it's been a little more difficult. But again, I think it just makes us better as managers, makes us improve ourselves, improve our skills, stay sharpened up as much as possible. Again, because time's not going to roll back. It's going to get faster and we have to adapt to change and be ready for anything, quite frankly. Yeah, I agree, Steve. I think that one of the things that we have a lot of pride here in Still Blue is the leadership team that we have. And even on the operations and manufacturing side of it, we are big proponents of personal growth and development. We have in our warehouse and in our manufacturing facility, we have a lot of people that are eager. I would venture to say that if a lot of our competition and just industrial manufacturers as a whole if they walk through our shop and saw the culture that we have in our shop, on occasion, we, we may fall a little bit behind on this process or that process. And w- without question, the adjoining departments and areas, they will all just go to wherever the help is needed, right? So the leadership there has established a very good culture of, hey, look, at the end of the day, we've got to get it done. Everyone's participating to help everyone else accomplish their personal goals. Individually, we all have things that we do, we all have things that we want to accomplish, but we're not ignorant enough to believe that we can do it alone. And so inside our organization is very much a collaborative effort across the organization, from those that do custodial work to our CEO that leads the organization. We've all been out at some point in the manufacturing facility, helping get it done, working, moving material, rolling doors, putting the fasteners in. So I think what we've tried to do to help improve what the future looks like for us is to create the culture that people want to thrive in. And that's really important for us because I also believe that at the end of the day, people are willing to do everything that they can to make sure that we as a company hold up the name that we have in the industry. Our commitment to those things are shared throughout every individual in the organization. So our future at Still Blue is amazing, right? It looks phenomenal because we know the culture that we're creating and everyone's buying into that. And so we take a lot of pride in that. We're excited about what it looks like. And piggybacking off of what Steve was mentioning as well about the young professionals, I also do think that there are a lot of young professionals that really one day want to sit in the seats that you guys are. They want to work their way up and get to that executive role. And they have that long-term vision for it. So what advice would you give to those young professionals that are just getting started out that they see what you guys are doing? They're just like, man, I want to be that. So I I will just say this. I think that a willingness to do what others want. Safety is first and foremost for us. Some of our core values is transparency and inclusion and evolution and collaboration. And as I said, safety, we really focus on, hey, how do we work together to make things happen? And so there's nothing... For me, as as one of the leaders of the organization, 
There's nothing that gives me more pride. I was blessed to have this happen just last week. When walking through the shop one day last week, I had two different individuals approach me and say, hey, look, I'd like for you to take a look at my resume. I want to see where I can be more valuable to the organization. And so immediately when a person has the initiative, has enough initiative to just say, hey, here I am, what can I do to help? That in itself shows a lot of initiative that you don't see a lot today. There's a whole workforce, and I know realistically we talk about unemployment levels and the workforce in general. There's a lot of people out there that are willing to work, but there's not as many people that are willing to go above and beyond. So we've got a shop full of people that are not there for a paycheck. They're there for a career. We've got people that are in their 20s, and it's not uncommon for them to say, hey, I hope to work here the rest of my life. And they're just, they're goal-driven. We've had, as I said a few moments ago, we're big on internal growth. We've got guys that are on our shop floor that that are MBAs, and but they started out in the production line because they knew that there was an opportunity for them. And we've made multiple promotions throughout growing our organization, again, for that internal growth. And that ultimately seems to drive even more motivation for those that maybe lacked that, but they see their peers growing and evolving in the company and taking on different roles and, and things of that nature. So then they're more motivated and more personally driven to accomplish something. And Man, what an opportunity for us to capitalize on that. And we've taken full advantage of it. That's an amazing thing to see, right? I get a little, I won't say emotional, but I get a little prideful about it when you see that because you just don't see that everywhere. And so we thrive and focus heavily on that. And that's what's made us as, as successful as we are. And that'll be the thing that continues to make us successful. Yeah, thank you for that, Bray. What about you, Steve? How do you feel someone gets in your seat? Just to add what Bray was saying, obviously, I look at is an employee asking questions? Is he showing up on time? The characteristics of the person, how he does his job. Obviously, most of us all started probably on a shop floor somewhere or entry level. And again, I put myself in their shoes. I'm going to ask as many questions as I can. I want to know what the company's doing, how to do my job better, how I can help the department, the company, and myself be active and be part of the solution and not the problem. Really what it comes down to is succession planning is big. We're not all going to be here forever. And we all truly want Steel Blue to not just be here in three to five years, but 20 years, 30 years. And so we're building a legacy. So we want everybody that works for us to understand that and want to be here and want to do their jobs and want to go above and beyond. That's what we expect. We have that with most of our employees. So we're fortunate. It's about building the culture. Not everybody's going to be happy, but we're going to tell them the facts and what's going on with the company, what we need. And we expect everyone to live by that, help us build it ask questions, absolutely ask questions. That's how we get better. There's nothing set in concrete. If somebody has a better way of doing something or just has another outlook on it, our ears are always open and willing to listen. So that's our perspective. Yeah. When you talk about building a culture for a company, that's not always the easiest thing to do. It takes a lot of consistency to do that. Buy-in from the executive team. And from somebody like myself, I've got to work with a few people from the Steel Blue executive team. And I think that you guys do an excellent job of creating that culture and letting it permeate down to everybody else. And yeah, good on you guys for that. Just switching gears, we got a couple more questions. Gearing towards the future, looking toward 2023, do you foresee an improvement in supply chain conditions, not only for manufacturers, but consumers as well in 2023? I think 2023, from a steel blue perspective, is kind of a pivotal year for us. We're going from a startup company making a handful of doors a day to making two, three, 400 doors a day. From that perspective, obviously, everybody has to be aligned. Supply chain, manufacturing, commercial accounting, everybody. But a lot of it does fall back on supply chain as we're building the company and increasing productivity. Kind of a lot of what I referenced earlier, it really comes to light where we need to be proactive. We need to always look for a better solution. I'm not saying better suppliers. We've got very good suppliers and vendors. But we need to challenge them and they need to challenge us. From a supply standpoint, that's only going to benefit us. Having input from suppliers, from even customers, having that perspective to know what everybody's thinking, what everybody wants, and basically keeping your finger 
on the pulse of the industry. And that's really the key going into 2023. And we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. We're going to be there. Absolutely. Have full confidence. As we're looking forward towards the future as well, what are some of the developments in Steel Blue's manufacturing capabilities that you're really excited about as you continue to expand across the U.S., essentially? I'll run with that one for a second. And again, I won't let all the cats out of the bag, but we'll share a couple of things that's very exciting for us. We try to take a very strategic approach as to how we do things. Given the market that we've been discussing from the supply chain side and both the end consumer market, we're very very much driven. We've done some napkin drawings as well, right? We've come up with ideas on pizza boxes, but at the end of the day, we vet everything out, right? And we play it out as the way it should be. We get the collaboration that we mentioned in our core values. And then we evolve and we include the people that need to be included. And we're very clear and transparent. All of that kind of runs together with how we become successful or how we've been successful and stay successful. And we're doing things. We've got some initiatives that we've already done that just hadn't been rolled out into the market yet, but in the very near future, by the spring of 23, early spring of 23, we will have moved into a new facility, right? Our physical facility is going to be almost five times larger than what we're in today. Our goal and initiative and modeling will be doubling essentially our headcount, but, and I know that seems like a lot, but that doubling of our headcount also increases our capacity by about three times what it is right now. So it's innovation at its finest, right? So We're leveraging efficiencies. We're doing the things that we need to do, uh, again, that the market is essentially demanding of us. We're really excited about that. We have some new product line coming out, some evolution in our product that'll be available in the spring. We're taking delivery of some equipment in the next 60 days that's going to allow us to be more efficient. That's going to enable us to better maintain quality control. It's going to, again, increase our capacity exponentially. But quite honestly, at the end of the day, I believe that the most innovative thing in our industry today is really what we thrive on. And that's adhering to our commitment. When we make a commitment that we're going to do something, again, as I said earlier, it's nothing for the executive team and the leadership of Still Blue going out and sweeping the floors and rolling doors and toting boxes of screws or nuts and bolts up and down stairs. None of that is beneath any one of us, right? And so from our CEO through Ashley, our marketing lady, the entire organization contributes to maintaining that level of service. And so while we talk about innovative product and innovative design and so many things that the industry wants, when we meet with people inside the industry and both consumers and just networking partners within the industry, when we have conversations with them, It seems like the most innovative thing that this industry wants today is just transparency and communication. And so we pride ourselves in that. Again, we're not going to bite off more than we can choose, so to speak. We're constantly going to push ourselves to be better every day in every aspect of our organization. But at the end of the day, when we make that commitment, we're going to adhere to that commitment. And God forbid something catastrophic happens and we're unable to perform. No one takes that harder than we do. But When we get to the point to where we've actually had to deal with that, we'll let you know how that feels. At this point, we've made commitments and we're performing to those commitments, right? And so, again, that continues to be our number one goal. The beauty of that is, is in today's market, if we can provide that level of service, the leadership, Mr. Barber and his staff on the sales side of the organization, I've never seen a group both in sales and manufacturing. I've never seen an organization that tried to work so hand in hand to the vital success of the company as a whole. Everyone in this organization knows that we have no opportunity of making it without the other. So when sales and manufacturing are cohesive and both driving towards the same goal, it's amazing at what gets accomplished. And then the support mechanisms of supply chain to accounting to all of those things working in conjunction with one another. Again, if you could just see, it almost makes you wish sometimes that you could divulge internal information so that people could see the success of the organization. But I think that's our success is resonating through the industry because of adhering to the commitments that we've made. I know I've talked a lot about that. That's what really is our focus is taking care of a customer and doing what a customer's needs, fulfilling and meeting those needs timely, efficiently, effective. When we tell you that we're going to be there on Tuesday, we're going to be there on Tuesday. And so I think that's probably the most innovative thing that's happened in this industry in the past 
15 years. It seems to have fallen by the wayside, so to speak, with so much opportunity out there. And this is a very robust industry. There's a lot of opportunity. But at the end of the day, if you don't do what you say you're going to do, you're essentially going to fail. And so we strive to maintain that commitment and that level of service. That's who we are at our core. Steve, did you want to add anything in as well as a closing note? Well, that's a tough, tough response <laughs> to follow. No, that was perfect. And I will leave you with, again, I know Bray didn't give up too many trade secrets or any items like that, but Steel Blue, our CEO says this a lot. We want to be the Amazon of the door industry where you've got complete visibility. You know where your orders at all times. You may not always like the date that's on there, but you know exactly what you're getting when it's coming. And that's where we want to be. We want to utilize technology. Again, it's all about the customer experience, making it easier to order, making it easier for us to move through the process from supply chain to manufacturing and from selling and so on and so forth. Again, that's where we're committed to improving our resources and building systems to better, not just us, but our customers well. On that note, I just want to thank Ray and Steve for taking the time out to come on first episode of Steel Blue Roll Call. It was a really fun time talking to you both, sharing your expertise with us and taking time out. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you at the next one. Jared, thank you so much. Steve, thank you for all the hard work from you and your team. We look forward to what we can do moving forward. Jared, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone.